Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. This is a podcast dedicated to helping individuals have a successful accounting, bookkeeping, and tax business. It's in the show that we address various topics that range from marketing, selling, pricing, things such as offering quality accounting services, getting paid what you're worth, onboarding the clients with confidence and having an efficiency to retain them as clients indefinitely. Just a variety of things to help you to become the accountpreneur. In fact, getting paid what you're worth, having the premier accounting service in your area. I'm your host, Roger Connect, president of Universal Accounting Center. And for more than 20 years, I've been working with individuals to help them start and build their accounting businesses. Whether it's a supplemental income, doing this part-time on the side, perhaps on weekends or weeknights, or perhaps something full-time as your primary income, this is the show for you. It's here that I'm able to actually help you by interviewing various guests and experts that have tips and tricks to actually help you apply in your business those techniques that you need to be focusing on so that you can, in fact, work on your company. Now, today we have a special guest, someone I'm excited to have on the show. This is going to be an excellent topic, one that I commonly get requests for. It is Stacy Brown Randall. Now, Stacy happens to be a multi-award winning author of generating business referrals without asking. She's the host of a Roadmap to Grow Your Business podcast and a national speaker. She has had the privilege of helping well-known corporations and franchises, but her focus has been on small business owners, solopreneurs, and sales professionals. Now, Stacy's programs are uniquely tailored to help you take control of your referrals, your client experience, and crush your goals. Stacy has been featured in national publications like Entrepreneur Magazine, Investor Business Daily, Forbes, CEO World, Fox News, and so many more. She received her master's in organizational communication and is married with three children. Welcome to the show, Stacy. Thank you so much, Roger. I am looking forward to being here. This is going to be a lot of fun. Now, I want to do a few things that I think a lot of people will appreciate. I want to define a few things for our conversation today that I think sometimes are foggy or kind of uh, unclear in people's minds. So let me ask you a question to begin, which is what is the difference in your mind between marketing and selling? Well, you know, I always think that the way that we typically teach the sales strategy, right, is that there's got to be some buckets to it. And so for me, selling is the act of being able to bring a client into, um, to be able to bring a client, you know, through the buyer's journey and then have them make the decision to work with us. But there are strategies and tactics that we use that are sometimes marketing in nature, sometimes prospecting in nature, and sometimes Mm -hmm. referral in nature to how we go about filling up that prospect pipeline. So for me, I've always looked at it as the sales strategy is like the overall strategy, but it's made up of individual tactics and marketing, just like prospecting and just like referrals are each part of the overall sales strategy. I know people talk about marketing versus selling. And to me, that's not the hierarchy. It's not a versus. It's a, we're selling and we may be doing that by marketing or by prospecting or by generating referrals. Gotcha. Now you're using the word referral and that's what we're going to be talking a lot about today. What's the difference between a referral and a lead? So the best type of lead is one that is referred to you by someone else. So again, this is one of those areas where we all just kind of gravitate towards whatever first definition we hear Mm -hmm. Uh of how, what a prospect is, what a lead is. Is it hot? Is it cold? Yeah. It, right. Is it, is it a prospect? Is it a lead? Is it referred? Like there's word of mouth buzz, like introductions, like there's all these terms that are out there floating around. And I really do think when people make the decision to start their own business or they first venture into sales, they have to kind to reconcile in their mind what those definitions are and what they mean to them. And then recognize that experts don't necessarily apply the same definition that they do (laughs) when they're teaching you something. So I always tell folks is that the way that I look at this is that whether I use lead and prospect interchangeably, other people would tell you that's part of a continuum, like they start as a lead and then can move to a prospect. For me, Everything starts the minute somebody has awareness of your business, but it's how they got to have that awareness of your business that kind of makes them that prospect. Um, And so for me, it is where they come from. And I think one thing business owners should do a better job of, and for some, they should just start doing it because they don't, is knowing where your prospects or leads, whatever you choose to call them, 
just knowing where they come from. And that is really, like, in my opinion, most important to understanding then what tactics and strategies you should be deploying to go to generate more of those prospects or more of those leads. You know, from an accounting perspective, you're, you're actually speaking in a language that I think we can all appreciate. When we're spending the money, we want to identify what's the return on the investment, the ROI. And so in order to know, is our advertising working? We're trying to track and identify where are these referrals, these prospects coming from so that we can double down on those and do it more. So I like that you're identifying that this is something important enough to be tracked so that we can at least know where where is the best time or money to be spent. So I like that clarification. So let me get into now with those those terms a little bit more clear, some of what we want to talk about, which is where do referrals fit into the sales and business development strategy? Yeah, so I think that most of the time when people think about their sales strategy, right, they think about it from a two-legged stool perspective, which let's be honest, it's probably not a very comfortable stool to sit on, but (laughs) they think about it from a two-legged perspective. And that is, I've got these prospecting activities that I do. I go to networking events, right? I go, I join my chamber of commerce or I'm in a leads group and I, I try to go and meet people and have them know that, you know, I'm a CPA, I'm a bookkeeper, this is what I do. And I do networking Mm -hmm. or I do the dreaded cold calling, Mm -hmm. right? Or I send out to the abyss of the internet, those, you know, lots of those cold emails. Um, Or I just kind of expect that people in my network, right, will just now know what I'm doing or know what I do and will come work with me when they need what I do. And so I think that there's things that we do from a sales and from a sales and business development perspective that is prospecting in nature. Okay. Short-term mentality, right? Like, hey, I'm going to go to this networking event and hope to meet somebody who needs a new CPA, right? Or who is looking for a new bookkeeper, Then there's the marketing things that we do. So this is the second leg of the stool for our sales strategy. And that is the, I may have a website. I may do social media posting. Maybe I do advertising. Maybe I do sponsorships. Maybe I go to trade shows, right? It looks different for every business. Maybe you want to earn PR. And so from the marketing perspective, there are different strategies or different activities or tactics that I deploy that are going to get my name recognition out there. I know it's a little bit longer term mentality, but the big thing that people always pay, they don't always pay attention to, but they think they kind of just know innately is who you're speaking to when you're in prospecting mode or marketing mode is trying to get the attention of the prospect, the potential person who could one day decide, yes, I want to hire you. And I always tell folks is that's not where referrals fit. Referrals do not fit within your prospecting or within your marketing. They are separate. Your your sales strategy needs a third leg to its stool, which will also make it a more comfortable stool to sit on if you have this third leg, right? And so the third leg is referrals. And I think what people, when they think about referrals, they use that word interchangeably with a whole host of other types of terms that are not the same at all. And so, you know, when you're talking, I mean, people will be like, oh, I was giving a presentation the other day and someone in the audience came up to me afterwards and decided to hire me. So they were referred. I'm like, no, they weren't. They were sitting in the audience and they heard you speak and they decided to hire you. (laughs) They came from your speaking engagement. And, And so it is just, I think that we use, I think the word referral is like such that like buzz term, like, oh yeah, get referrals. And then people use it in context is where it does not belong. And that just muddies the water. So when I talk about sales and we talk about business development and sales, have prospecting, yes, have marketing, yes, but have referrals and keep it separate from your prospecting and your marketing activities and mentality. And here's the biggest reason why and the best thing to remember from a referral perspective. When you're doing prospecting, when you're doing all that networking or cold emailing, and when you're doing marketing, when you have your website with your contact form, you're hoping to speak to the prospect. But when you have a referral leg that is a a bucket that is a part of your sales strategy, you're not speaking to the prospect. You don't know who the prospect is. It's the referral source, the person who knows the prospect that's going to refer them to you. That's the end user of your referral plan or your referral messaging. And that's why referrals don't fit within prospecting or marketing. And that is also where all of our old school referral tactics come from. When someone tells you if you want referrals, go ask for them, go pay for them, or go network to know a ton of people, they're thinking about referrals like they fit within prospecting they don't. Or when they tell you to be overly promotional and gimmicky and put like the greatest compliment you can give me as a referral in your email signature line, (laughs) they're 
talking about referrals from a marketing mentality, but they don't fit there either. They need to be removed from your prospecting and marketing plans and create your own plan for the referral piece of your business because everything you're going to do is different because of who you're doing it for, which in this case for referrals is the referral source, the people who are willing to put their reputation on the line and refer you. Correct. You know, I I love how you're describing this because when I think of the marketing, all the time and energy that we're putting into our businesses to find these prospective clients, there's these contacts that we're getting, whether it be somebody that's calling in, maybe someone we're meeting somewhere. But you're right. If I'm speaking in an event and someone comes up and speaks to me, that's tied to the event. I position myself as an expert and this person came over to speak with me afterwards. And that's a contact that I got from that speaking event. But a referral is a totally different animal. In my opinion, the referral is someone that needs to be treated in a different light because they need the white glove treatment. This is someone that by definition, in my opinion, they've been referred by perhaps a contact, a colleague, they've been referred by a a current customer. Someone has endorsed me. Someone has gone so far as to put their reputation on the line to suggest me. And this is someone I, I just don't wanna plug into my system and let them go through the normal process of being nurtured. I want to give them the white glove approach and recognize that someone went so far as to recommend my services, what it is I do, put my name associated with theirs. So this referral is something special, and I want to give it that attention and honestly put them on the accelerated path to becoming a client because honestly, I think with that endorsement, they've got the social proof they're maybe looking for to now go ahead and and buy what I have to offer. So I, I like how you're putting the emphasis on the referral being a separate uh, effort or en- uh, em- emphasis in getting clients. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because what people don't recognize is that at the end of the day, referrals come from relationships. Mm-hmm. So our responsibility to be able to generate more referrals and do it in the way that I teach, which of course is the without the asking and paying and being gimmicking promotional and networking, mm-hmm. to be able to generate those referrals, it really comes down to the relationship you have with the referral source. And that's really important because people only refer people that they trust. But what is really interesting is when you think about why referrals happen. See, I have to trust you to refer to you, but that's actually not why I refer you. I refer you because I know somebody who has a problem and I know you can solve it. So I get to look like the hero and I get to help somebody, which is, I think, how most of us are built to want to help other people. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, we're dead inside and then, you know, not so much. But From that perspective, I really think it's important for people to recognize that when we're trying to generate more referrals, the focus isn't on that prospect that's going to be referred to you until they're actually referred to you because you don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. But it is all on that relationship you have with a referral source and how you take care of them. And, you know, in some cases, when you have someone referred to you, they could very well follow the same process any other prospect who comes to you through a speaking engagement or hears you on a podcast. They could follow that same process. But like you said, in some cases, there may be a different approach that you have as well to that prospect once they've been referred, Um, just because to your point, they are typically going to be quicker and easier to close because they come with someone's trust already transferred to you. But I always tell folks where we're missing our opportunities is how we take care of those referral sources who refer to us and doing that in a way that ultimately works to be able to generate more referrals, but doing it in a way that honors the person and is authentic to who we are. Perfect. Now, a lot of people in the accounting space, if they hear peers, they're always hearing that their business is growing based on referrals. I mean, it's just a flippant uh, phrase used, (laughs) but the definition might be a little different from person to person. But here's my point. There's people out there that are wondering, where are these referrals coming from? I'm not getting these referrals. What am I doing maybe either wrong or what am I not doing at all that I should change so that I can get referrals? So let's talk about that. What what can I do to uh, maybe generate referrals? You've shared a few things already, and I just wanted to kind of bullet point those. Yeah. So here's the first thing I would say, just going back for just a minute to what you said about, you know, people say, oh, my business comes by referrals. When someone says that to me, of course, this is because this is what I teach. My response is always prove it. Because at the end of the day, we say that. And like you said, it's kind of like this flippant thing that we say, oh, yeah, my business is built by referrals. And then I ask people to actually look at their data and really determine where their clients 
are coming from, where their yeah. prospects are coming from. And a lot of times they're surprised that it's not coming from where they think it's coming from. So I think when people are sitting there thinking to themselves, okay, I get some referrals, but I want more. Or why am I not getting more referrals? My clients love me. They tell me they love me all the time. Why am I not getting more referrals? It's It starts with, of course, what I always like to call like the foundational disclaimer, which is... I will always walk somebody through how to go about getting referrals, but it starts with you understanding that the one thing I don't really help you with, right, is the great work that you do. You got to actually be referable to receive referrals. Now, Amen. is there is there a way to generate referrals through your client experience because you give great work? And of course, you're also being intentional about how you cultivate those clients to become referral sources, of course. So, but when I say be referable, I mean like, Nobody refers crappy work. Like you have to be worthy of those referrals. And if you are referable, then you absolutely deserve referrals. But what you have to remember is you're never owed them. You're never owed a referral just because you do amazing work and your clients love you. And so that's important for us to recognize is first, be referable. Second is, okay, well, then you've got to think about referrals differently. If you're not getting as many or any that you want, you've got to pay attention to, well, what are you trying to do to receive them? And if you're like most people and you're like, well, I've been told to ask or compensate and I don't want to, and I don't have time to network, and I don't want to just use hope as a strategy and hope they show up, like, what are my options? Well, for a very long time, there weren't any other options. So people got to a place where they just thought, well, referrals will happen when they happen because I don't want to use those other slimy salesy tactics to Mm -hmm. get people to refer me. I always say, let's reverse engineer that, right? Actually, if you want referrals and you're getting some, but not as many as you want, first identify who is referring you. Yeah. Look back through your prospects, whether those are people who said yes and became a client, the people who are still in process with you, or they said no or not now. Look back at what's their source. Where did they come from? Did they see you at a speaking engagement? Did they answer a Facebook ad? Did you meet them at a networking event? Or were they referred to you? And capture the referral sources names. When we know who our referral sources are, whether you have three or four people on that list or 30 or 40 people on that list, that defines everything we do moving forward. And people, I sometimes think they try to jump to the, like, to the front of the line. They're like, okay, just tell me what to do. And I'm like, it starts by knowing who we're doing it for. Mm -hmm. Like, who are your referral sources? Because if you look at your list of referral sources and you have three, then my recommendation to you is not going to be the same if you have 30 referral sources. So first identify who's referring you, who's referred you over the last couple of years. And then, and, and here's the thing I always tell folks, this is based on real data, not what you think you can remember or your anecdotal evidence that's swimming around in your mind, mm-hmm. right? Like we can kind of remember who referred us the last three clients, but I'm talking about, do you remember who referred you in January of 2020? Like you're going to have to get into your data within your business to extract that information. And you may have to remind yourself of that information or go ask your client, I know you were referred to me, but for some reason we didn't put it in our records who referred you to me. We're trying to clean up our records. I'd love to know who referred you to me or how did you hear about me, yes. right? If you're not sure if they were referred or not. Because when we can determine who's already referring us, that's our low-hanging fruit to go and get more referrals. So that is always the starting point is identify your who. Well, one of the things that I'm hearing from you that I think everyone's going to really resonate with is the fact that you're talking about tracking. And uh, if there's an accountant out there that likes to track, they're going to bra- embrace this. And I have to admit that's <laughs> most all of them. So the idea of putting now that source to the to the referral or to the origins of where this contact came from makes sense. But here's the thing that I think is interesting is you said it so well when you identified that the the origins of the referrals actually begins with the quality of services that we're providing. Are we providing exceptional experiences for our customers that at the end of the day, they become advocates or promoters of who we are and what we do? And what we want to do is then after identifying that these people, these individuals are in fact the source of our most recent new clients, then we're able to go back and not just reward them for those referrals. I I think that's another discussion, but you're talking about now can we intentionally nurture that relationship so that they continue to feed us the people that they have already done so. Um, This is an intelligent conversation for us to be having. So the question I have now is how does 
referrals? How can referrals themselves help us stop from having to sell? You know, one of the best things about having a prospect who is referred to you is that the conversation dramatically changes Mm -hmm. just because of where they're starting from. Yeah. When somebody already has vouched for you, has told you, hey, I trust Roger, this is who you need to go work with, it just completely changes the dynamic. And so the conversation starts from more of a place of curiosity of like, okay, why? Versus, oh, let me make sure you understand everything we do and that I'm cross-selling you and upselling you and I'm walking you through our history and the why behind our story and like all the things that people sometimes do in their sales pitch when they're talking to someone who doesn't have a frame of reference Mm -hmm. for really understanding what they do. When somebody's been referred to you, yes, it's important that they understand how you work with people, like the like the model of the of the client engagement. And of course, they need to know and understand what it costs, like what the investment is. But at the end of the day, they're really starting from a place of they're almost coming to you and being like, just take my money. Like, I've got this problem. I've been told you can solve it. Let me make sure I agree with that in our conversation. And really the whole conversation comes from a place of just making sure you're the right person to help them solve their problem. And it's a total shift in a dynamic of how that conversation goes. And they're, of course, my favorite conversations to have, right? Because I already know what they probably are thinking. And I know by who's referred them, right? Then I also know probably how I was set up. And that's another thing, too, is when you pay attention to who's referring you, particularly if they refer you multiple times, you start to get a sense of how these people were set up by that referral source to really understand what you do. So I have a uh, a CPA who works only with law firms, Mm -hmm. and he refers me most of his clients. When they talk about wanting more clients by referral, he was like, okay, you're going to go through Stacey's program. And he refers them to me. And I know when they come to me, it's going to be questions he's told them to ask me. It's going to be like, oh, yes, okay. So he told me to ask you this. And and those are perfect because I already know they're already trying to close themselves. They're just trying to make sure they're okay with everything I have to say. But they already trust me in my process because they trust the person who referred them to me, right? Because he knows it's going to work for them. And that means everything and totally changes the dynamic of the conversation. Perfect, perfect. Now, you've said a few times that uh, there's there's an maybe a, maybe not a disadvantage, but there's something to be said about pain or asking for referrals. How it can change the relationship that you have with your people that are sending you these contacts. How does pain or asking for a referral maybe change that relationship? Yes. Yeah, so. They have the the same outcome, but we just get to it from different ways. And I always say this, when you ask somebody for a referral, you are actually giving them work to do. And that moment when you ask somebody a referral, when they haven't offered to refer you and they don't know anybody that they need to be referring to you and you ask them to refer you, you're artificially creating what doesn't actually exist. So now they're trying to figure out how to become the hero for someone. They don't even know if they need a hero to refer to you because you've asked them to consider who may need to work with you. And that actually goes against the psychology and brain science of why referrals happen in the first place. Mm. So you're asking them to artificially create something that doesn't exist, which effectively feels like work. Because they're like, oh, um, okay, let me think about it and see if I can come up with anybody who needs you. right? And they usually don't. And they usually avoid you after you make that ask, particularly if you're making the same ask over and over and over again. But unfortunately, that is the strategy that's been taught with asking. The strategy that's taught with asking is that that's the trigger. Every time you ask, you have a better chance of triggering somebody to give you a referral. But what that means is you never get to stop asking because you have to constantly be asking people for them to think of referring you. I like to eliminate that completely and take care of that relationship in an entirely different way so that I'm always top of mind so that they're thinking to refer me when the opportunity arises. Mm -hmm. And that's really important. And then the compensating piece, the minute you offer someone compensation to refer a client to you, you've now commoditized the relationship. You've made it about money, not about them trusting you and thinking you're the right person, but because they're going to make a buck. And for a lot of people who don't want to be compensated, right, now you've made things feel icky. And so here's what I'm, what I'm not saying is 
everybody has, people have strategic relationships and affiliate relationships where it's disclosed up front to the client Mm -hmm. that, hey, if you click this link, I'm going to earn a commission, right? Like we, oh, I got it. Okay. If I click this link, they're probably going to earn some money because we're told in advance. What I'm talking about is when people offer to compensate, they're never telling the client. They're never saying, oh, I referred you to that person because he paid me $1,000 or $150 versus I referred you to the best right person. They never share that. So it becomes under the table. It becomes a kickback. It becomes this thing that becomes a secret. And most people don't want that on their conscience when they're actually referring someone to you. They do it because they're trying to help somebody. And how they're going to help them is by connecting them to you. So you have to really pay attention to the the psychology behind what it does to your referral source when you offer to compensate or you or you're always asking for referrals and then when people are like oh okay that makes sense then you start thinking about well then is there another way so is there a difference between pain versus someone who's given a referral and you want to thank them and you send a gift basket, you take them out to lunch, you uh, send them a, a gift card. I mean, is there a difference between paying and thanking? Yeah, so definitely, absolutely. Paying is when we're announcing it up front. Hey, if you refer me, I'm going to give you X, Y, Z, right? It's an, it's, it's the, enti- we think it's the enticement to get them to refer us. It does, we just don't pay attention to the fact it usually backfires. But when someone refers you, thanking them is actually very important. But there's two things I want you to understand about this. Number one is you never wait to thank them until that prospect becomes a client because then you're rewarding them for outcome, which the referral source does not control. Yep. So it's really important you're going to thank them by the act, right? We thank for the behavior of referring us, not for the outcome of the referral. So we want to make sure we thank right away when they refer us, regardless of the outcome. And the second thing is, if your strategy is only to thank people when they refer you, You could go six, nine, 12, 18 months in between thanking them while you're waiting for that next referral. So whereas it's very important to thank our referral sources every time they refer us, and you can do that in a multitude of ways. If you want us in a basket, great. If you want us in a gift card, fine. Do you have to? Of course not. What they want is to be acknowledged. So a simple handwritten thank you note will actually suffice. But then you also have to have a plan of how you're going to nurture that relationship that is independent of them sending you referrals and you're thanking them. But it's a plan that you have that's, you know, it's outreach you're going to do to those referral sources. It's planned out and it's going to happen where you can nurture that relationship and it's going to happen over the course of year to year to year so that you can continue to get referrals from them. But that's when we talk about the what do we do to nurture that relationship and then what do we say while we're nurturing that relationship so that we can get them thinking about us from a referral perspective. But that runs in the background, right? And then every time they refer you, you're still thanking them. But you also know, hey, if they don't refer me for three more months or six more months, I know I'm still going to be able to take care of them following my referral plan. You know, I loved how you just described all that because I think you're spot on. First of all, there's a distinction between affiliate relationships where we're paying for that remuneration of, of services, but there's that that thank you that's after the fact. We're not paying them. We're not, as you described it, we're not trying to have them take on a new responsibility or burden or job for us to be our salespeople. It's basically something that they're doing out of out of a recognition of the services that we offer and the need of the potential client. So now you're giving a thank you, but I loved how you described the thank you. It could be as simple as a card, but it's not when we get the business, it's for the referral itself. We're thanking them for the referral. It's up to us to now move it along through that process to becoming now a customer. And perhaps at that time, it's appropriate to even thank them for the customer because then we can at least update them and and report back what came of that referral that they've provided us. They would like to know, you know, hey, are they using your services, I'm sure. But the point is, is you've illustrated very well all of this, but it all starts with one, the tracking. And I really think uh, as accountants, we want to tie the source to the referrals that we're getting. And then secondly, it's being grateful for those and expressing that gratitude and giving that thank you. I love that. So here's the next question. Uh, How do you get referrals if you're not asking for them? Yeah. So it really comes down to what we've been talking about. It's identifying who your referral sources are. Who are the people who are already referring you? That's the place we want to start. Now, for the person who's sitting there thinking to themselves, okay, I don't have any of those people, right? 
obviously there's a way that we that I teach people to cultivate clients and contacts into referral sources if you don't have referral sources. But for most people who've been in business at least longer than a year, you probably have some people who are referring you. So that's the first thing we talked about, right, is identifying who your referral sources are. And then the second piece is creating that strategy, that plan of how you're going to nurture that relationship. And we're going to do it. It's going to be planned. And it's going to be these things that we're going to do not just this year, but next year and the year after and the year after. But we're going to make sure we're focusing on being memorable and meaningful and staying top of mind. And there's a framework that I teach it around what this plan will look like and what our outreach or the connections that we're doing with our referral sources, what they need to contain and what it looks like um, to really make sure we're doing the right things and not the wrong things and not too many times a year because then it's weird and not too few. You can't just do one thing a year and think you're going to have a referral explosion. Mm -hmm. But it's, okay, we know who our referral sources are. We're going to build out this one-year plan to, to take care of them in a very different way than what people think. And we are not talking about your e-newsletter. That does not count. (laughs) And we're not talking about you sending them a koozie with your logo on it. That does not count either. But building out the right plan with the right connection points, we call them touch points, but the right touch points, and then using the right language so that they're always knowing how how you feel about them and that you are thankful for the fact that they do provide referrals to you, right? You're thankful for the fact that they do put their reputation on the line and refer to you people that they know. And so it's the language that we use, but you can't use the same thank you for referring me every single time you're doing your outreach. So we teach this concept called referral seeds and it's understanding the formula of it. And then of course, seeing examples of it to understand how we plant those, how often we plant those, when we plant those, when we don't plant those, along and tied to those touch points that we're doing for our referral sources throughout the year so that our referral sources always feel like they're taken care of, but it's we're not doing something daily, weekly, or even monthly. This is about really making sure that we are staying top of mind. We're not trying to keep in touch. We're trying to raise above that and really stay top of mind, which means we do certain things, but we get to do it less, but we have to use the right language while we're doing it. This is a plan that you build And then you execute on in your business on an ongoing basis, the same way you execute on things in your marketing plan and the same way you execute on things in your prospecting plan. But you've got to have this plan built to know how you're going to execute on it. I love it. You know, one of the things that you said at the very beginning of that that really resonated is the word relationships. In accounting, we sometimes get so fixated on just the love of the work that we have, which is numbers and it's it's impersonal. But in reality, our business is entirely built upon relationship. This is, in fact, still a people business. And when it comes to referrals, one of the things that I I really appreciated was the touch points, the frequency. You're right. You can do it too often and become kind of needy and annoying. You could do it too infrequently. And it's just like the relationship isn't being nurtured enough that they're feeling comfortable with you because it's been too infrequent. But there's that sweet spot that we're looking for. But the thing I'd like to also uh, delineate here is there is a distinction between referrals that come from customers, people that are paying for your services, love what you do, experience what you do, actually know what it is you do, versus people that might be uh, contacts that you have in the business world and so forth that know what you do, but they might be in like type businesses or spheres where they're very familiar with what you do and may talk to similar type contacts. And that's where they're comfortable referring you because they interact with you on a regular basis. That really kind of comes to those networking groups and so forth. There's a familiarity with your services. They're aware of what you do. They may not personally be using you as a customer, but they're definitely aware of your integrity, who you are as a person. They have a context of what your services are enough that they can recommend you. So there's those two different types of sources and, and, I, I'm liking how this is all coming together. So do you um, have any uh, suggestions as to frequency? You were alluding to it earlier. I brought it up. Any suggestions on that? Yeah, we always tell folks that your ability to stay top of mind and to be memorable and meaningful, depending on what you're doing, is going to fall somewhere between four and eight touch points in a year. But it also has a lot to do um, with kind of how your business is structured as to where you'll fall within that range. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty wide range between four and eight. But most people in their first year, we always recommend that they're doing six to eight touch points per year, depending on what the way that we teach it. It's what you do depends on how often you need to do 
things. Mm -hmm. And so usually six to eight in your first year, but you know, like I have somebody, a business owner who's in my program. And when she, at the end of 2020, when she built her plan for 2021, she built her seventh year in a row referral plan. And so now that she's been nurturing these referral sources and adding new ones when she's needed to and really taking care of these folks and doing that for six years, now going into her seventh year, she's not going to fall in the six to eight range. She's going to be more in the four to five range. But that because that she has consistency of how she nurtures these relationships. And this all comes down though, to being genuine and authentic. This works when you actually want to take care of your referral mm -hmm. sources, when yeah. you're actually thankful for the fact that they make it easier for you to grow your business. Of course, it makes sense. Of course, I want to take care of them in the right way. Like, why in the world would I not? That's when this works. When your heart is there and then you have the right strategy behind it, right? It's almost making sure you understand that, yes, then it's six to eight. And what are those six to eight? And they look different for every person. But what everybody who has success that works with me does know is that this comes down to the place of I want to take care of the people who take care of my business. So this makes sense to do this. And then everything else after that is just semantics, right? It's just figuring out what it looks like for you in a way that's going to, you know, work for you and work for your referral sources. But every plan we build and that we see our clients build, it all comes down to who are your people that then determines what they ultimately need and what they need from you. Um, and most people are usually surprised to learn what that is. But this is, like you said, we're looking at six to eight touch points a year. This is not something you can do we daily, weekly, or monthly mm -hmm. because it's too much, but you can't do it once or twice a year either. Yeah. You know, there, there are two words that really come to mind as you shared all that. One is deliberate. There's definitely a process, a there's an intention of behind this and being deliberate. You've got a plan. You're actually organized and you've got a strategy. But the other is sincere or genuine. You want to be genuine and sincere in this in the sense that all of a sudden these people need to know that you have a, 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 an emotional interest in what's going on in this process, them, the referrals they're giving you and so forth. So I, I really like that. Um, I'm going to switch gears on us here real quickly. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in kind of backing up a little bit and having you share with the listeners, what is it that got you to this point? You know, why are you the referral guru? How did you get to this point? And, you know, <laughs> what draw, drove you this direction? Starting your business, back up for us a little bit and give us a little bit of history here. You know, it's really funny. I really wish, Roger, that I could be like, oh, the story is so awesome. I just, one day I woke up and God was like, boom, Stacy, now you're brilliant when it All comes right, to Stacey. referrals without asking. Stacy, I'm going to give you permission right now to embellish. Go. Okay. <laughs> I wish I could say that's what it is, but it's not. <laughs> Actually, the reality of it is, the truth of it is, it's everything that I teach people now and have been doing so now for about the last decade came from the School of Hard Knocks and very painful School of Hard Knocks. I actually had an HR consulting firm where I had big name clients like KPMG, BDO, Ally Bank, that were my clients. And from the outside looking in, you would have been like, wow, Stacey's business is crushing it until it wasn't crushing it anymore. Mm -hmm. And it failed actually after four years. I didn't quite make it to the five-year mark, became part of the 82% of business owners that don't make it to the five-year mark. And the business failed and I had to go back to corporate America. And when I reflected on why it failed and I got over the ego bruising and all those things, I paid attention to what my business had to do different if I were to restart. Okay. So I got certified as a productivity coach and I was like, okay, let's be successful here in any way different from how I was trying to do it before. So I wanted more referrals. And then I realized I didn't like any of the ways people taught me to get referrals. I was like, nope, not going to ask, not going to pay, not going to network all the time. I've got three kids. Are you kidding me? Not going to be, you know, overly promotional and gimmicky. And so I basically started just seeing what would, ha what would stick. I was like throwing spaghetti on the wall to be able to generate referrals and reverse engineering it and paying attention to the psychology behind it and built that strategy for myself and made my coaching practice successful in its first year with a 112 referrals received that I didn't ask for. And of course, that kind of opened up for my clients to say, what are you doing? And then I was starting to teach them. And then of course, here we are almost a decade later. And this is what we focus on is helping people understand um, how to generate referrals without asking. But it truly started because I didn't want another business failure and I wanted something I would enjoy. Wow. I love it. So tell me about the book. Why write the book? You wrote Generating Business Referrals Without Asking. Tell me about why and what it is. 
Yeah. So, you know, the book, it's one of those things I've been teaching this for a number of years. And the book was always like that natural next step. Because it was one of those things that if you want to reach more people, the ability to be able to do that is in any format possible. It's why I have a podcast. It's why the book came out. It's my ability to let people know that, hey, I know for generations, like we're not talking decades, we're talking generations, the number one piece of advice when it comes to referrals is just go ask. And if you are uncomfortable with that, too bad, get over yourself and go ask anyway. And the majority of us are like, um, no, thank you. And so my strategy came from that place of wanting to change that. The book was just a natural extension of how I could reach more people with understanding that, hey, you know what? You can get referrals without asking for them. And the book, just like the podcast, just like the articles that we have, just like being like this, a guest on other people's podcasts, is just spreading that message so more people will understand it. All right. So now you've got your family, you've got your spouse, your three children. They're watching you do all of this. What are you hoping they're learning about you running your business, about life, and and what lessons do you think they should be taking from them or from you as they're watching you do this? <laughs> I sometimes wonder if my kids, right now they're 11, 13, and 14, they're all in middle school. Um, I sometimes wonder if they are looking at me and running my business and think to myself, I have got to be an entrepreneur because mom is always around. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm usually the one picking my kids up from school every day. I'm usually the one being uber mom in the afternoon. But that's the beauty of being a business owner and building my business the way that I've built it and going through the structural changes. They won't remember when they were babies and it did not look like this. They won't remember the fact that I actually had a business fail and had to go back to corporate America. Um, they won't remember all those things because they happened when they were so much younger. We talk about them, but they won't remember them as much as watching mom now walk 15 steps outside our house to the detached office that she's created and try to hide out there as much as she can as well. Uh -huh. But recognizing that I'm helping people and trying to help people every day and being able to create an environment to where I can do that, but also within a structure and a lifestyle that allows me to be a very present mom and wife. And, you know, my husband always says this. He was like, if you're defining success with a number, you're probably doing it wrong. And always reminding ourselves of that's kind of what we're looking for in life is like, you know, the type of family we want to have, the type of relationship he and I want to have, but also building a business that allows me to still do what I'm really, really good at and love what I'm doing, but doing it within the context of boundaries. Perfect. So this question, I, I don't know if you're going to have an answer, but we're going to give it a shot. Have you worked with a mentor, a coach? And if so, what have they taught you? What did you take from that relationship? Yeah. So throughout the years, most definitely, I've definitely worked with different coaches. I've been a part of different masterminds. I think they all bring value in different ways. But I think one of the best things, whether it's a mastermind or you're working with a business coach, I think one of the best things they can do is they can get you to challenge what you think is real and really understand that maybe what you think is real. And if it and if the worst thing happens isn't actually as bad as it is, then you can actually move forward um, kind of releasing some of that fear. I mean, the truth is my business, my first business failed. That's kind of the worst thing that could happen to me. And guess what? It happened and I lived through it and I actually came out better for it on the other end. So it allows you to kind of release some of those fears and those moments. And I think coaches are sometimes really great at reminding you of the things that we, we think we know, but then we get way too up in our heads and we yeah. forget some of the good stuff we do know. All right. So two more questions. The next one is, if you could go back and speak to your younger self and knowing the struggles, the challenges that you were going to face in running your business, starting your business, perhaps even the considering the failure that you had before, but then going into a second one, do you dare? What advice would you have for yourself? <laughs> um, trust God more. He knows what he's doing. Excellent. And then the last question, what are you thankful for? Oh my gosh, what am I not thankful for? <laughs> There's so much to be thankful for. But I think at the end of the day, I'm thankful for clients that believe in what I do. And they don't just believe it because I tell them to, but they get to see the hundreds of business owners that have come before them and had success. But they they believe it and they they allow me the opportunity to help them in a way that allows me to see their success. And that is just such an enjoyable thing because 
the reason why I'm so thankful for my clients is not just because I get to feel good about myself when I help them, but because what I get to do with them and the way I get to do it allows me to live a very full life with all the things that matter to me. Being, you know, a child of God, but also a wife and a mom and a business owner. And I don't kick butt at all of them all the time, but I do do parts of them very well at different times. And just knowing that that's actually what makes life go round. Excellent. Perfect. I love it. So first of all, thank you for opening up with us, Stacey, and sharing these things. I, I really appreciate the explanation you gave us of referrals, the process, but at the same time, just kind of sharing a little bit about yourself. I'm going to do a, a few things here real quick. One, I'm going to speak of some offers that we've got for our listeners that I'm excited to share. And then also I'm going to do a recap of our discussion. I'm going to come back to you when I'm finished just to get a closing thought. So first of all, let me begin with the offers. Stacy has something here that I'd like to encourage everyone to take advantage of. It's actually going to be found in the episode description. You just need to go to the description to find the information that we're looking for here. It's basically an opportunity to take a free nine question referral ninja quiz. There are three levels of being a referral master here. And what we want to do is give you an opportunity to go and take Stacy's quiz and get the information to do so, so that you can see how you're coming out in this three-tiered approach of looking at it uh, at the referrals that you're generating. And then the second thing I'd like to make mention of is we were talking about tracking and kind of following where these uh, sources are and where the uh, referrals are coming and the leads that we're generating. For that reason, I want to suggest that you actually learn more about the tech stack associated with the universal CRM. What do you need as a CRM for managing your contacts, your customers, so that you can be efficient in basically finding, nurturing, and selling these individuals that you're getting, but even more importantly, automating the process to complement what you're doing on a regular basis, organizing your thoughts, and like Stacy shared, becoming deliberate in your efforts to generate the referrals that you need. So I want to encourage you to go to the episode description and get those things that are available, the nine uh, question quiz, as well as the information regarding regarding the universal CRM, the tech stack you need to run your business. Now, as a summary for our conversation today, the first thing I'd like to emphasize is we always, as accounting professionals, work, we're always going to hear the word referrals. I grew my business based on referrals, but there's definitely people out there that are in that process of either starting that they haven't been with people long enough to get referrals, or they're not networking or putting themselves out there enough to have people actually share their names. So I think this is a discussion that really can get to the heart of how many businesses are actually grown with very committed, loyal customers and its referrals. And I think it can be an excellent addition to the marketing, the various strategies that we have to get our name out there and grow our business. Mm -hmm. Referrals should be a deliberate one in that. And so she shared some great suggestions, not only how to go about them, how to avoid putting the referrer in an uncomfortable position, uh, asking for it or paying for it and so forth. She also talked about touch points and frequency, just a variety of things that I think we need to use to deliberately make this a part of our business strategy to grow our business. She's an excellent uh, resource for this, and I'm happy to have had her on the show. So Stacy, what are your final thoughts? The number one thing people need to do if they really want to take control of their referrals and start generating them in a way that works for them is to identify who their referral sources are. There is something extremely empowering about knowing who the people are who take care of your business now. And when you see that list of names in black and white, first and last names in black and white, and you see who those people are, the question you have to ask yourself is, okay, do I want to do something a little bit different and take care of these people in a way that will work? And then and seeing that list will help you decide what you're supposed to do. Exactly. These people are your fans. They are your promoters. So do you know who they are and are you taking care of them? I love it. So with that being said, I want to thank all of you listeners for having the time to listen to this episode. I would encourage you to listen to our other episodes as well as subscribe to our podcast. This podcast is definitely committed to helping you succeed and in fact have the premier accounting firm in your area. So take the time to listen to our other experts, the episodes that we have listed, as well as subscribe to the podcast. And for more information on how you can apply these principles in your business, visit us at universalaccountingschool.com or give us a phone call. You can reach us at 801-265-3777. And with that, be safe out there, enjoy life, and always remember this, if it's about accounting, it is universal. Take care and have a great day.